Hello, Satya Doyle Bayok. Um, we are very glad to have you on our podcast. Um, so you are a psychotherapist in Portland and have just written a book called Quarter Life. And before we start, I just want to say thank you so much for writing this book because I think it's so badly needed. And I say this as someone, uh, I guess as an ex-struggling quarter lifer <laughs> and also as a podcaster and a therapist that we get a lot of questions actually often from parents mm-hmm. of like concerned parents, frustrated parents of children in quarter life. But for those listening who maybe don't know about your book, could you just say a little bit about the premise of it and what motivated you to write it? Sure, absolutely. And let me just say what an honor it is to be here and how thrilling it is that you connected with the book in that way. So I define quarter life as being the first stage of adulthood between adolescence and midlife. So it's it's adulthood. It's the first part of adulthood. But I really want to offer that this is a stage of human development that we can all be focusing on a bit more to support people going through this time of life to understand a bit more of the roadmap and also for their parents to understand. Of course, we have, as you just said, so many people struggling in this stage of life and their parents and even their grandparents, aunts and uncles, people are worried, right? And was it that you were getting a lot of this like client group into your room that you were like, I can see that there's this need here for a, a sort of more of a language, more of a discussion that we're not kind of having in society. Like there, there isn't, I suppose we sort of expect, there's like the terrible twos where we expect toddlers to go through things and there's adolescence. And I don't think there really is that language around that stage of adulthood. There's very little of it. So I was like you, I mean, as you said, an ex, I, I was struggling a great deal in this time of life. And, and ra- really the practice that I opened and even my going to graduate school was born out of a sense that something was really missing in terms of an understanding of what myself and my peers were going through, but also that I could see was far beyond our community, that it wasn't that we were just struggling, but really in contrast to the terrible twos, it's not even that it's not understood or seen. It's also that whatever is happening is being made fun of on a pretty regular basis in popular culture or in clickbait media. There's a lot of looking down on, which then teaches people in this time of life to really feel ashamed of themselves. Uh, And there's a lot of condescension for what has often termed narcissism or navel gazing, this idea that if you then go to therapy or if you are struggling and want to understand yourself better, that is itself some kind of a problem. So it puts a lot of people in this time of life in a double bind of both really wanting to explore themselves and understand what's happening and simultaneously feeling really self-involved if they do that. My practice really was constructed to support this stage of life. And the book, of course, came out of all of this of really how how do I, but we as people in this field and culturally kind of offer something that is useful to to people passing through the stage of life and of course their parents as well. It's so interesting because I think you're right. I think there is this sort of sense of, oh, they're a bit lazy, that generation. Or when I was that age, I just like... (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> just got up at 8 a.m. and worked till midnight and why can't my children do that and do you think that comes from sort of a different experience in generations I quote the developmental psychologist Eric Erickson briefly in my book and unfortunately I won't be able to say the quote verbatim now but he essentially <laughs> says every 20 years older generations say what's wrong with these kids and they think it's brand new that they're saying that And in fact, every 20 years, the next generation rolls their eyes. What's wrong with kids these days? And so that is part, I I think it's incredibly common. I think it's a timeless process of older generations sort of looking down. And I'm eager for us to stop restarting the conversation every 20 years as a result, because we, we have generational labels for people. It's a very pop culture thing, uh, but it's repeated over and over and over again to the point that people wonder what birth year you, what specific year and do you, are you on the cusp or, and it's all made up. But what happens is that each generation then is supposedly has, has these characteristics and these behaviors, and it makes it very difficult for us to talk about it this time then as a stage of life in the same way we talk about toddlers or infants or midlifers, we don't we don't ascribe every behavior to the year they were born in the same way that we do for people in their 20s and then 30s as well. Right. 
And I think it's so interesting what you write about that kind of need to separate in that stage of life. I think you've got sort of four, the four pillars and the first one is separation. And I I do a podcast with my mom and my sister. (laughs) And there's no way, right. But there's no way I could have, I'm 40 now. There's no way I could have done that like 20 years ago, because I think I needed that separation. I actually moved to Australia. So I just went like, how, (laughs) how physically far away can I go? And it, it was very sort of painful. And so the book really resonated for me from that perspective. And I, and I suppose for me at the time, in my mind, I was thinking, I thought I was supposed to have done this already. Like, like I, I'm in my 20s now. I thought I was supposed to have sort of done this in adolescence and I should just be sort of good to go. Oh, fascinating. And, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I, and I don't know if that's a sort of common experience of sort of that sense of like, I should be ready because suddenly I'm 18 and 19 and 20. And it actually... It, it, I think maybe that used to happen when people well, got married I, younger. I don't know. I mean, I, I love hearing what you expressed first, because I think the way you you named that you could not do a podcast with your mother and sister prior to leaving, that in fact, that is the work of separation. I talk about the p- four pillars of growth in quarter life, the first being to separate. And that when I'm talking about it, people think what I'm expressing is sort of get a, get away, don't come back. <laughs> when really it's all the psychological work of dealing with the bits of trauma, the bits of patterning, the bits of, of whose anxiety is whose, whose belief systems are whose, so that you can be in a more conscious and loving relationship. Hopefully, sometimes really significant boundaries are involved. There are toxic relationships. But when the relationship is available for any kind of repair and, and real intimacy, a younger person has to find themselves as separate from just, they can't just be the clone of their parents. And and that's not psychologically healthy, right? So, but what's so beautiful is that you are doing work with your family and doing similar work and that you really see what it took for you to separate first and find yourself and come back to do that. I just think it's, it's a perfect example of what I'm trying to express. No, I, I mean, it definitely was very like that for me and I think it was also it's not just kind of separating myself from my parents in terms of like working out who am I not in relation to them I think it was also to do with that sort of realization that again in my mind I sort of thought should happen during adolescence like oh my parents are not perfect and I'm angry with them at all of these things and I need to express that (laughs) you then realize oh but they're they're just they're humans who are who are doing their best and I can that's right like understand that (laughs) that's right and and that takes years and years and years in fact there's the sort of catalyst that happens in adolescence with the anguish and the frustration and the acting out we talk about that in developmental psychology and then a lot of the midlife literature which is decades later deals with your your parents are passing away or they're getting older and now you need to really wrestle with what were those relationships like and I, that's where I, I, I take issue with that I think yeah. in fact if if we are able to do that work earlier and we're able to do that work ideally not in adolescence when we're often still living with our parents or just out the door and not in midlife when there is really no opportunity then for deepened relationship with them. They're getting older there. They need us in different ways. But to do this work in quarter life, in the, the 20s, ideally, and into the 30s, we have such an opportunity for enriched, depthful relationships. That's hard to get to when you're an adolescent. You're just basically trying to leave the nest. Like, I got to get out of here. And how do I survive on my own? After you start wrestling with some of those things, there's a lot of other deeper questions that open up. And what do you think, I mean, this is a really big question. (laughs) What do you think would sort of help society as a whole with that process of of having those conversations, it being really just named as, as a process in life? That's I, th- I think giving it language is a first step. And, and any time something is normalized and popularized or seen, instead of it feeling like something that is self-obsession or people being too intense, they want to have these conversations. If we can really make therapy and therapeutic language just a very normal part of becoming human and of being in a family with other people or being in friendship, being in a couple 
it just, it makes all of our lives better because we are able to deepen relationship and deepen intimacy. We don't need to hide behind behaviors or, or cold walls. We can actually be in relationship with each other. And for me, that's the most enriching part of my life is, is genuinely connected relationships with, with various people. And to have that in your own family is profound. So the more we can normalize that and celebrate that, I think the more we can support people to step into it themselves. Absolutely. And I also really loved what you wrote in the book about ritual, like that lots of other parts of life, there's these kind of rituals that are, are built into it. But in this part of life, there, there isn't any kind of rituals. And it, it made me think of, I know in some Amish communities, they have like the rum springer, where you go off for a year. I'm not sure how old you are when you do that. Six, but... I think 16, I think. Oh, so you're really young. Wow. Okay. <laughs> but um, but it's, it's exact. I love you bringing that up because it's all about, yeah. do they are given the choice. The right. notion, as far as I understand it with Rumspringer, and, and I'm no expert, but you're given the choice. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. To say, hey, this this is a tight-knit community. This is a very specific way of life. And we don't want you kicking and screaming in 20 years and saying, I never chose this. And so we're going to send you out into the world and you're going to decide, do you want to come back or not? And yeah. I think it's a phenomenal example of that journey because it is a very, it is a much more specific I don't know how guided it is. I think it's more kind of, in a certain respect, see how messed up the world is and you'll want to come back. <laughs> you'll be scared. <laughs> you'll be scared. But I, but it, but it's a journey. It, it really is a, more of the hero's journey of go venture out and see what your life looks like. And now, for the most part, we just have an academic ladder. And it doesn't provide, it's so cerebral. It's so often very abstract. It doesn't provide that encounter with life that is critical for this time of life. Right. And, and I think there's something about that academic ladder, which you've kind of been in this like process your whole life, right? Like as soon as you start Absolutely. school, it's like, okay, then this grade and then this grade and then this grade. And it's like, suddenly, what is that supposed to be the rest of my life? I'm just, I just go to university and then I get a job like it feels very sort of narrow and I think that's quite a good way into this really fantastic framework that you set in the book about how people tend to be either more sort of meaning making people or people drawn to stability and if you're sort of on the stability track from what I understand is when you finish university you're like drawn to stability so you get the job as a lawyer or an accountancy training and that's where you go. But if you're meaning making, that's the time of life where you really might feel quite lost, sort of mm -hmm. post wherever you kind of end up academically. And I would love for you to say a, a bit more about that framework and how it's kind of, I mean, I found it very helpful in thinking about clients that I see and thinking about myself. And I'd love you explain it a bit more. I'd, lo I'd love to. Thank you. It's a perfect, perfect uh, description already. So I talk in the book about Really, it's kind of a polarity on one pole are stability types. On the other are what I call meaning types. They're sort of archetypes. Uh, it's a simple typology for people in this stage of life. And the notion, as you express it, is that stability types have kind of a set of values that are instinctively more oriented towards security and stability. And also, and this is maybe kind of a dirty word, but a bit of conformity, that they're comfortable conforming. They're comfortable checking the boxes of social expectations. And maybe it doesn't occur to them that there's anything wrong with any of that. They just want to succeed. They want to be kind of good kids. And they also want to climb the ladder. They want, they want to be, I use the, the career of lawyer a lot, but this can go to anything. But, but there's a sense of success and a sense of I want these things. And, and often, too, I want to be married by the time I'm 30. I want to be having kids by the time I'm 31. There's a really a clear sense of goals. Meaning types on the other side of this spectrum in a sense, explicitly don't want any of those things. Those things sort of feel like an allergy to them. They're trying to avoid those things. What they want is the opposite of conformity. It's a sense of who am I specifically? What creative work makes me feel alive? How can I make the world a better place? And there's more of, instead of a, a strong sense of structure, there's kind of a sense of unstructuredness. And so what I say is that both types ultimately need to find their way towards a bit of the other side so that more we're trying to find the middle way between stability and meaning. 
So that wholeness for every human being is their own definition or their own image of what a sense of stability and meaning looks like. So that we we can live lives that feel safe and secure for, for the most part, right? And that also have a sense of, of uh, purpose and uh, meaning and a sense of knowing why you as an individual person are alive, that you're not just checking boxes. You actually have a sense of, oh, this is what my life is about. Right. It sort of makes me think of that kind of dialectic that I think comes up a lot in therapy of kind of acceptance and change. Mm -hmm. And it's yes. sort of like knowing that you need to be able to have both and that actually being totally on one side or totally on the other is not a way to have like a, a fulfilled, meaningful life. And it doesn't mean that you can't be a stability person. It just means that you need to find the things that kind of can add creativity or Absol add sort absolutely. of a, a freedom. Yeah, I use the image in my book of a, of a fireplace with fire inside and that stability types are often a well-constructed fireplace, but there's no fire. There's no sense of passion and mystery and, and also that quality of wildness that fire comes from nature and it and it's connected to something deeper and and more timeless than the human construction of a fireplace but then meaning type similarly you can't just have a fire that's burning wildly right, <laughs> right. it needs some containment it needs in order to live as a human being and not as a wild animal you need some sense of containment and some relationship to the collective and so I talk about those two things needing to be together. And when stability types construct the perfect fireplace, they will ultimately want to have some sense of passion and wildness. And that's where a lot of crises come in. When we talk about the midlife crisis, for instance, specifically, I really see that as a crisis of stability types, having checked the boxes and then looking around and wondering, what, what was this for? Is this all there is? Why am I living this way? I thought... I thought if I checked these boxes, I would feel satisfied and I don't. And what's happening is a lot more people are encountering that sense of kind of grief and shock earlier in life. Yeah. And I wonder if it's also like I've, I've been sold something <laughs> and now I've got here and it turns out to be a fallacy. Like I, I've been told my whole life that I just do the next thing and do the next thing and do the next thing. And, and that's what... I sort of should do and then suddenly you sort of realize oh like hang on but but have I been doing this for me is this really what I want but I, I think that that's a struggle the sort of meaning stability struggle I think is something you probably have your whole life right and some of this is not possible but when people are feeling deep despair and yet they did everything right they do feel lied to and I think it's important to to really name that social script is kind of just a cultural invention it's not, again, deep psychology. It's just a notion that if you do these things, you'll be happy. Typically, older people have already figured out that's not true. But the, the story still is go to college or university, get the good grades, find a partner. And then it turns out that it's not working for a lot of people, right? So it is then when you've got the kids or whatever it is you're doing, how can you allow yourself to seek a little bit more if you're in that situation and just find the little things that actually do calm your body down, not just in a terms of wellness or self-care, but actually in a sense of what does my soul need? What are the things yeah. that are going to bring me a bit more of meaning and purpose day to day? Right. Like I have a very close friend who has to make money, got children, et cetera, et cetera. But they sort of always secretly kind of wanted to be a writer. Now they're sort of in their 40s and they're sort of panicking a bit. And so they've started just getting up an hour earlier and just writing for an hour. And their whole sort of psychology has changed. And it's not like they've decided to leave their job, but they've just they've found a way or like this is this does something for my soul. This is this is who I am. And I can't be that all day, every day because it's not practical but I can find a little way to, to begin exploring that part of myself. And maybe that will grow into something, but like, this is where I can start. That's exactly right. It's, it's so beautiful. And it, and I think that's part of just changing the conversation so that we can take ourselves seriously when our soul is calling to us. Mm -hmm. It feels so critical because so much of the narrative is, well, if you're not going to start making money as a writer, what's the point? Right. I, in fact, that phrase, what's the point? Anytime that comes up with my clients, I, I zero in because if they're, we could call it their ego or whatever it is internally that's saying, what's the point? Don't bother. Typically, if that defense mechanism is coming up, there's something very important 
that the old way is defending against. And I want to know what is so deeply calling that something else is saying it's useless. It's stupid. Don't look at that. Look, look the other way. Yeah. Uh, and it's beautiful when people can embrace it. And just as, as your friend is doing right for an hour in the morning, it doesn't, we don't know where it's going yet. We don't know, but it's making a yeah, difference. Absolutely. They kind of need to work out for themselves. That's right. So I imagine for parents, it's kind of backing off and, and giving your child some space yeah. and trusting them. Have confidence in them that if, if you do that, if you believe in them and allow them that space, and ideally, if it's possible, have them see somebody to talk to as well, then in a way, just sort of you need to kind of let them figure it out for themselves. I think that's true. And I also often really strongly encourage parents to get into therapy if they're not already, because very frequently what can be happening is some anxiety or need or expectation for their child. Children generally want to be pleasing their parents, even when they're kicking and screaming. We are all wired to be deeply, deeply loved. We seek deep love from our parents. And so even when a quarter lifer is seemingly doing nothing to please their parents, they may be simultaneously absolutely hating themselves and ashamed internally because of that kicking and screaming. And so parents often need to do their own work and express repeatedly to their quarter life kid, I'm gonna love you no matter what. I don't want you to feel pressure from me. I, I am scared, I am overwhelmed. I don't understand what's happening, but I will love you no matter what. I want you to find out what you need. And that kind of repetition and space and freedom can often provide enough trust to allow the quarter lifer to, to find their way in it, and, and actually step out on their own somehow because so much of what's happening inside is is just a roller coaster of stress and also shame that they're not performing. Yeah, I think that's a really beautiful guidance. And I think the bit about like the parents' own stuff is, is so important because I think I imagine a lot of that of what the child is feeling is also kind of a projection from the parents, like the parents' own anxiety. No maybe question. Their experience, what they would have wanted, all sorts of things. <laughs> so much. And and that's, it's, it's so intense in this time of life. Just as the person, just as the young adult is trying to find out who they are, they are feeling extra pressure to do what their parents want. And so it, it really becomes a, an incompatible crisis right? But yeah. not everyone's needs can get met simultaneously. And, and that's, I think, where a lot of that sort of frozen shutdown happens for families is everyone is trying to get their needs met. And by doing that, nobody gets their needs met. Yes. And I think it's not helped by society because I, I feel like the sort of society narrative of what you should be doing. And then also because you often have a lot of peers who may be are the more stability types who have kind of finished university, beginning to get jobs. And then that sort of cycle of comparing yourself to others and thinking, well, I should be at this stage of life or I should be even this idea of that, like that this is a stage of life that I should be at, I think could be really unhelpful. It's exactly. I mean, the pressure comes from every direction and even peers. You start to feel very embarrassed that you're not where you're supposed to be at 26 or you're not where you're supposed to be after college. And yeah, so the pressure is coming from every direction. And we just have so little guidance societally to say, actually, here's what is going to be helpful for you. It just keeps being about figure it out, get a job, figure it out, finish school, whatever, right? It's all very structural. It's not a lot of psychological conversation on the deeper levels of what somebody developmentally needs to be doing right now. Which is why your book is so great. And Th really... Thank you. Thank you. It means a lot. Yeah. <laughs> I was very grateful that you named that you couldn't help everybody because in the book, you've got case studies, which are sort of composite of lots of different clients. They're not individual clients. And they're really fascinating and very relatable. And you kind of see the arc of their stories. And yet sort of sometimes you read that and you sort of think, oh, like, but uh, that didn't happen for me or that's not happening for my clients. And I think there's something about being a, a psychotherapist where it's so important to acknowledge, like, it's almost like an ego to think that you could help everybody, right? Like, that's, it's just it's just not in your power. And so I was really grateful that you sort of named that. Oh, well, I'm glad I'm glad you <laughs> you saw that and it and it meant something to you because I, I did it both for other therapists and for clients. I've had the experience reading 
books that have case studies from clients or whomever. And, and it's surprising how much a little bit of shame we can pick up. Like, but I, I didn't get better doing this. Why, right. why didn't, what's, what, what's wrong with me that I didn't get better or for therapists, like, Oh my God, that therapist seems like they just totally know what they're doing. Like, I don't know what I'm doing. And of course it's a book. It's meant to be read for slightly different purposes. So I, what I wrote at the end is something to the effect of, look, these stories wrap up pretty easily. I'm doing that because really explicitly, I also think it's really important to provide hope and that I have had a lot of success seeing clients go from being in very bad places to really shockingly thriving. I mean, it's remarkable what can change. And I want that to be understood. So we don't have a baseline of relative suffering as our goal. Right. But I also, it's so important to emphasize these are tidy stories that are showing up in a book in a few chapters. And this isn't, this isn't the whole story of how therapy works. Right. And actually in a way, I think that is a message of hope too, right? Like, Because it, it's sort of saying, like, just because the first time you went to therapy, you yes. didn't have this tidy arc where you walked out being like, Ta-da, I'm fixed now. Like maybe at that phase in life, you, you can only do what you can do right then. It doesn't mean that you're necessarily going to be in that place forever and that you like failed therapy. Absolutely, yes. It just means that like, that's that's okay. That's where you are. And it doesn't mean that you can't end up somewhere else later on. It's sort of like a sort of message of of self-compassion and actually hope, I would say. Oh, I love that. I I think that's so important, too, because a lot of folks can feel like if they don't get better in therapy in half a dozen sessions, that they're broken forever or therapy is useless. And it is it is important to really say, like, yeah, sometimes it's not the right match or sometimes it's not working or whatever's unfolding, but mm. that there, there is absolute hope to keep trying and come back and, and try another round. And I actually think your whole book is kind of a, it, it is a message of hope. It's sort of saying, if we can do this, if we can support this quarter life phase, that would actually be quite transformative for society yes. as a whole. <laughs> I think that <laughs> I really do. I believe yeah. it. It's so important. Yeah. I so wish we were, I so wish that we were viewing this stage of life differently and providing more resources and also even structurally providing more in terms of tangible support to people versus just an expensive university degree. There's so much we could be doing. So I, I, I'm glad that you had that experience reading the book. Yes. Well, um, thank you so much, Satya. And thank you for coming on our podcast and talking about it. And I would really recommend everybody reading it, actually, whether, whether you have a child, whether it's you, I think it's a very, very helpful book and I found a lot of really useful insights and also just useful ways of framing that phase of life. Thank you. Well, it is such an honor to be with you here. So thank (laughs) you. Thank you for reading my book and having me. Thank you.